is uh, this is the last of, of my lectures and the last lecture of the course. So pretty soon we are going home. This is on lobular carcinoma in situ. We'll talk about morphologic variants and management implications. And I'll review with you uh, the morphology of LCIS uh, with uh, uh, information from the WHO 2019, the fifth uh, uh, edition of the WHO classification of breast tumors. Discuss differential diagnosis and pitfalls. Talk about ecadirine and related proteins that we use for diagnostic purpose with some notes on management of these lesions. So this is the um, breakdown of um, epithelial tumors of the breast that includes a specific section on non-invasive lobular carcinoma, uh, lobular neoplasia that includes uh, atypical lobular hyperplasia and LCIS with the three forms of LCIS, the classic LCIS, and then we have uh, the new entity in a sense, uh, florid LCIS and pleomorphic LCIS. We'll talk first about the classic lobular neoplasia as it, that is important to understand how to best uh, diagnose uh, the other uh, special variants of LCIS. So classic LCIS is defined as a discohesive proliferation of type A or type B epithelial cells. For those of you who uh, are not familiar with type A and type B cells, here is an example. The type A cells are small cells with uniform hyperchromatic nuclei. Nucleoli are rarely visible. And type B cells are slightly larger and have a slightly larger vesicular, more open nuclei with more open chromatin. They have a mild variability in size and shape and small nucleoli. These two cell population, as uh, shown in this example, may be mixed in, in individual proliferations. And uh, uh, the same cells are found in ALH, a typical lobular hyperplasia, which involves only less than 50% of the asini of a terminal duct lobular unit. They are expanded and uh, uh, they're filled and expanded, but the proliferation is more limited in extent. If there is involvement of uh, uh, the uh, ducts, so that does not exclude the diagnosis of ALH. It's really the amount of, uh, of uh, uh, expansion that is present and uh, we can have a pagetoid involvement of the TDLUs by ALH. <clears throat> Things I look for when I, uh, you know, evaluate a lesion and I, I'm thinking about, uh, is it lobular neoplasia, classic lobular neoplasia? I go specifically and look for intracytoplasmic vacuoles. Uh, I almost require intracytoplasmic vacuoles for the diagnosis of, lobu of uh, lobular neoplasia. And I also look for what I call the spidery cells. If you, uh, to me, that's how lobular neoplast, the cells of classic lobular neoplasia look like. There is a central portion where there is the nucleus. So the cytoplasm is very inconspicuous, really difficult to, uh, to see. And then there are the, these spidery projections at the periphery that remind me of the leg of a spider. So very similar in morphology. This morphology correlates uh, with uh, ecadirin negativity, at least in my experience. Another thing, so I always look for the spidery cells. And another thing I look for are the myepithelial cell nuclei that are always found at mixed with the classic lobular neoplasia. And they look like a little, they're hyperchromatic, little comma shape or apostrophe shape. And these help me and they're kind of a clue that I'm truly dealing with the classic lobular neoplasia. Now this is, uh, you know, classic LCIS and ALH. We all know that these are lobular centric. We can have pagetoid spread. They're characterized by decision. The cytomorphology, as I just described to you, the cells are round to oval with central nuclei. They are not polarized. And uh, I always refer to these as fried egg type of appearance with the nucleus in the center. The nucleus has low nuclear, uh, low grade um, morphology. So it's very small, uh, regular um, nuclear membrane and nucleoli tend to be inconspicuous. And again, we already talked about the 
intracytoplasmic vacuole. Usually, we don't find any mitotic activity in classic lobular neoplasia. According to the fifth edition of the uh, WHO classification, single cell necrosis, apoptosis, is possible in classic lobular neoplasia and does not rule out uh, that possibility you know, that uh, diagnosis shouldn't make you diagnose a higher grade uh, variant. Calcifications tend to be rare and minute. We know from many uh, studies that uh, actually traditionally ALH and classic LCIS uh, were uh, incidental findings uh, in an excision or a biopsy done for another reason. But we uh, have, are learning uh, and we have evidence that actually MRI can detect uh, classic lobular neoplasia. So sometimes we get an MRI guided core needle biopsy that has ALH or classic LCIS, and that is uh, a radiologic pathologic concordant finding. Uh, classic lobular neoplasia is multifocal in about 80% of cases, bilateral in about 30 to 40%. Morphologic mimics of, classical, of classic lobular neoplasia include uh, uh, um, a few, uh, quite a few. One is clear cell change where the clearing of uh, the uh, cells is within the cytoplasm of the cells and usually you can still see cell borders. In contrast, the clearing that you see in classic LCIS is secondary to the spaces that, that uh, you know, get formed between the cells where they retract from one another. So that is the clearing, so it's very different. Intracytoplasmic clearing in clear cell change versus, uh, you know, some clearing that occurs outside the cells in classic LCIS. Clear cell carcinoma, clear cell DCIS also has intracytoplasmic clearing secondary to usually accumulation of glycogen and also the nuclear atypia will be higher in general than in classic LCIS. Another possible mimic, this more mimic of ALH, is the, the presence of conspicuous myopithelial cells that sometimes can have more cytoplasm, be more round and prominent, even sometimes with a clear cytoplasm, and even uh, in, you know, suggestion of intracytoplasmic vacuoles. But the distribution, these are usually cases of adenosis, and the distribution is somewhat regular, while in ALH uh, you find a little bit more irregular distribution of the atypical cells, uh, and in some areas you will find more diagnostic findings. So uh, immunost <coughs> excuse me, immunostochemical stains uh, for T63, for example, will help in the differential diagnosis. The major differential diagnosis is between uh, um, LCIS, so and uh, solid ADH or low-grade DCIS. What helps uh, is in terms of uh, finding focal areas with uh, uh, polarization of the epithelial cells. So if there are these little glands uh, that uh, are better um, identified at medium to low power and then kind of disappear at high power, but uh, here is another focus right here. Um, the, this uh, finding, the finding of this microacinar arrangement does not occur in lobular neoplasia. If you find it, you can almost be 100% sure that uh, this would be an ecadine positive lesion. It's a ductal proliferation. And then if you have uh, any, you don't find that, uh, and you know, there is a now at our disposal immunostochemistry that can be applied with LCIS that is negative for ricadirin, beta-catenin, and shows cytoplasmic staining for P120. I'll come back to that later on. <coughs> now, classic lobular neoplasia can involve other lesions and then give rise to possible differential diagnosis or mimic um, other uh, alterations. So, for example, I've listed them here and we'll go through all of them uh, depending on the underlying uh, lesion that is involved. We have different uh, possible scenarios. Here is an example of classic lobular neoplasia that partially involves uh, normal acini. Normal acini are shown on the right. 
we have two cell populations here, the ductal luminal cells that are polarized and the myoepithelial cells at the periphery. Um, this is the normal situation. In partial involvement of uh, uh, no normal asinine by classic lobular neoplasia, you may get this idea that there is a proliferation that looks atypical and, uh, you know, it's focally almost uh, cribriforming. forming there is polarity here. The clue to the correct diagnosis is recognizing that there are three cell types here. There are uh, the uh, luminal cells that are residual and normally polarized along the lumen. There are the myopithelial cells, and you see the comma-shaped uh, elongated nucle hyperchromatic nuclei that are present in these areas where we find the fried egg cells, right? Uh, so three cell types, uh, this is not ADH, uh, this is uh, ALH involving a normal asinus. Another situation is when classic lobular neoplasia involves uh, UDH. Uh, here is, uh, you know, a proliferation with the spinning in the center, characteristic of usual ductal hyperplasia. But then there are these uh, cells uh, scattered here and there. They look paler, round, little fried eggs uh, scattered throughout. These cells, uh, we stain it with Icadirin. Well, is this positive or negative? What's your thinking? It's negative, correct, even though there is a lot of positivity, but that is secondary to the residual ductal cells in the center and probably even myopithelial cells at the, you know, in the periphery. So the clue to the interpretation of this staining is to find areas where there are two or more cells that look atypical, these cells, and then evaluate the membrane, the space in between these cells. There is no staining here. This is lobular neoplasia. Collagenospherulosis is a very cute lesion that consists of globoid deposits of eosinophilic or more mixoid and delicate extracellular matrix that is surrounded by basement membrane and myoepithelial cells. It's common in sclerosing lesions such as papilloma, all the sclerosing lesions Dr. Collins was discussing yesterday. Sometimes it can occur and can by itself be mass forming with a one to three millimeter size, a small mass, but many times comes to detection uh, even mammographically because it has calcification. These globoid deposits of, uh, um, you know, the material can calcify and uh, uh, be detected by mammography. I, I had to show you this uh, cute bunny. So uh, it's a case of collagenospherulosis. Here is an example of collagenospherulosis with uh, a lot of calcifications that, uh, you know, in uh, a low power impression may mimic a case of low grade DCIS. Notice uh, that, uh, you know, there is a proliferation all around it, uh, that it's quite, uh, you know, monotonous. There are these cribriform, pseudo cribriform spaces, this uh, is an example of uh, collagenospherulosis uh, involved by classic lobular neoplasia, mimicking uh, low-grade ductal carcinoma in situ. How do we, uh, sometimes the nuclei can even be a little, you know, the nuclei of the cells uh, <clears throat> show some more atypia. So how do we sort out these cases? Uh, well, uh, um, we have to first uh, notice that these are not uh, true cribriform spaces, these, you know, pseudolumens are filled with this fibrillary material that is the very delicate matrix characteristic of the more mixoid variant of collagenospherulosis. Then we have cells at the periphery that are vacuolated, you know, they have intracytoplasmic vacuoles, so that is uncommon in cribriform carcinoma in a low-grade cribriform carcinoma, then and suggest the lobular neoplasia. Other features uh, at the periphery of these uh, pseudocribriform spaces, we find like a dense cuticle that appears to be basement membrane, and then uh, there are these uh, nuclei that are clustered uh, along, uh, you know, tangentially all around uh, these, uh, um, these pseudocribriform spaces, and these are the nuclei of the myoepithelial cells. So there is no polarity around uh, these uh, pseudocribriform spaces. The cells are 
the neoplastic cells are nice, uh, you know, they have the typical fried egg morphology that we associate with the lobular neoplasia. And here are some residual ductal cells for comparison. Here is a beautiful example of the tangential nuclei uh, of the myoepithelial cells. And then I always hear the signet ring cells. And then I always point out that sometimes uh, the basement membrane around this, uh, the cuticle basement membrane around these uh, uh, structures collapses and uh, then uh, transects uh, the pseudocribriform spaces. This would never happen in DCIS because, uh, you know, there is, the spaces are empty in DCIS and this is a characteristic sign, sort of diagnostic of collagen spherulosis. And then uh, this appearance altogether is diagnostic of lobular neoplasia and collagen spherulosis. Now, there is actually, I mentioned myopithelial cells a number of times uh, in my presentation on lobular neoplasia. The myopithelial cells and classic lobular neoplasia in particular seem to be growing well together. Uh, we, in three different patterns of growth, uh, have been described. The so-called normal pattern is where, uh, you know, the epithelial, the myopithelial cells are still uh, remaining in the typical location along the basement membrane. And then the um, lobular neoplasia grows wedged in between the basement membrane and the overlying residual flattened uh, ductal epithelium. This is uh, quite a common pattern. Another pattern is a, a more perpendicular growth of the myoepithelial cells, where instead of being tangentially oriented along the duct, the wall of the duct, they seem to have a more vertical position and they are oriented perpendicular to the basement membrane. And you see that here with different uh, immunohistochemical stains. And uh, some pagetoid growth uh, can be present in these cases as well. And then there is a, a third pattern that is the one that creates problems because uh, that is a true myopithelial hyperplasia associated with lobular neoplasia and the myopithelial cells interdigitate with uh, the LCIS cells and they grow really in the center of the asini. And uh, you can see there is a lot of positivity for calponin and SMA that really extends uh, with a linear distribution along uh, the, uh, in this space. And this can create uh, problems because the myoepithelial cells uh, per se are not ecodigen positive. So this is an example of a case uh, of uh, collagen spherulosis uh, that had originally been interpreted by the pathologist as collagen spherulosis with uh, lobular neoplasia. And then uh, uh, an ecadigin was done, very positive, right? A lot of positivity with membranous uh, linear staining. And uh, the case was interpreted by another pathologist as diagnostic of uh, DCIS or ADH. This is a small focus. There was a lot more. So he interpreted as low-grade DCIS. But the pathologist, the first pathologist was concerned. It's like, it doesn't look like DCIS to me. So we did a calponin stain and look how beautiful. It really highlights all these spaces. There are spaces of collagen spherulosis and the cell, the staining along the membrane is the staining of all this projection of the myoepithelial cells that encase the lobular neoplasia. There is one area here where there is no staining. That's where probably there is more lobular neoplasia growing. Here is an example of classic lobular neoplasia in collagen spherulosis that clearly a low power, uh, everybody would diagnose as DCIS, right? But uh, notice the spaces are very different uh, in size uh, and uh, that's unusual in low grade DCIS. In general, the spaces are all of the same punch. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> The spaces are all very similar in size uh, and even shape, like here there is some variation. And again, calponin comes to the rescue. There is a lot of myopithelial hyperplasia in this case. This is another case of collagen spherulosis, beautifully mimicking low-grade DCIS. Another possible mimic of uh, um, another situation where uh, 
classic lobular neoplasia involves an underlying lesion and then can mimic something else is uh, um, when the lobular neoplasia involves a sclerosing lesion. We saw some examples yesterday. Here is another one with ALH in sclerosing adenosis that mimics an invasive lobular carcinoma. Notice though that the outline of these uh, pseudo-invasive uh, cells is actually very smooth and they seem to be surrounded by basement membrane. Here is another example, side by side, um, we have uh, sclerosing adenosis with a classic lobular neoplasia. On the right is true invasive carcinoma, lobular carcinoma. And you see here in the, on the right, uh, when there is true invasion, usually the, well, the cells are in direct contact with uh, the collagen fibers and they grow <laughs> in uh, with, you know, they don't have that rounded, uh, round arrangement at the periphery. They're, you know, more single file that we find uh, in uh, um, collagenospherulosis, sorry, in sclerosing adenosis involved by classic lobular neoplasia. And of course, a calponin stain or a myopithelial stain uh, will be helpful. <coughs> so now we talk about uh, a classic lobular neoplasia. Let's look at these two unusual new variants uh, and the cri diagnostic criteria. Florida LCIS is uh, defined as having the same cytologic features of classic LCIS, but is characterized by marked distension of the TDLUs or ducts, which creates a confluent mass-like architecture. And it should have at least one of two architectural features. There is either little to no intervening stroma between these markedly distended asini of involved TDLUs, or there is an expanded asinus of duct that fills an area equivalent to about 40 to 50 cells across in diameter. Here are the examples from the WHO book, Florida LCIS, same cytomorphology as classic LCIS. It's really a different architecture, massive expansion of the asini. They almost touch, they really touch almost one another. And there is, you know, so much that there is no stroma in between these expanded asini. And it, sometimes, uh, um, you know, the expansion is such that uh, there is more than 40, 50 cells across uh, the diameter and you cannot even fit one asinus in one uh, high power field of view if they're so big that they, you know, uh, really are too big even for a high power field of view. And uh, you can find the necrosis and uh, uh, even calcification in the center of these lesions, but the neither one is required for diagnosis. And you can have either type A or type B cells forming this uh, uh, florid LCIS. So the two classic morphologies of type A and B cells can be, um, can be found in florid LCIS or coexist even in, in the same case. And just to emphasize the point uh, that I was saying, uh, this is an, kind of an architectural uh, diagnosis, a diagnosis based on architecture that is very exaggerated. The cell cytomorphology is exactly the same as in classic LCIS. And here is uh, from the same case, I took two pictures, one of uh, an area of florid LCIS and one of an area that looked like classic LCIS. If you look at the cells, they are the same, but it's really a massive expansion of uh, the asinus that uh, is characteristic of florid LCIS. In contrast, the pleomorphic LCIS is composed of cells that are larger, have marked nuclear pleomorphism with the nuclei that are uh, four times or more the size of adjacent lymphocytes and are equivalent to those of high-grade DCIS. Sometimes uh, florid, pleomorphic LCIS can uh, have apocrine morphology, and we call uh, pleomorphic uh, LCIS of apocrine type. We have uh, actually found that also class, uh, florid LCIS can have apocrine morphology. So apocrine morphology does not, uh, you know, it's not, uh, per se diagnostic of pleomorphic LCIS. You can see it also in, even in classic LCIS sometimes, 
but it's also in Florid LCIS. And here is another example of pleomorphic LCIS with apocrine morphology, very large cells, very big nuclei, prominent nucleoli. Sometimes they are the binucleate cells uh, uh, that we, you know, they are not uncommon in these cases, somewhat reminiscent of uh, melanoma actually in, in some of these cases. But the pleomorphic LCIS can also be associated with the comedonecrosis and calcifications, which leads uh, eventually to mammographic detection, but neither one uh, is um, required for the diagnosis of pleomorphic LCIS. And again, uh, just to emphasize the point that the diagnosis of pleomorphic LCIS is based on nuclear features and cytomorphology combined and not on a massive, uh, does, it does not require a specific architecture. Here's an example of a case where just a couple of asina are involved, a little bit expanded, but the cells are pleomorphic. There is no question about that. And they're lobular. They're all nicely rounding up and diseases. So this uh, um, is a focus of pleomorphic LCIS, even though let's say you have only this, this qualifies as a pleomorphic LCIS. There is not such a thing as pleomorphic atypical lobular hyperplasia. And again, the florid LCIS and pleomorphic LCIS may coexist in the same case. And sometimes we see a little bit of transition of one into the other. Now, the WHO has introduced an interesting and useful, uh, you know, definition for LC, useful guideline for LCIS lesions that are borderline between classic LCIS composed of type B cells, like seen here, and uh, uh, with scattered cells that are larger and have more pleomorphic nuclei. And they recommend to categorize uh, such lesions as classic LCIS composed of type B cells. Um, sometimes one can say there is focal nuclear pleomorphism, just to explain that. But overall, this is a classic LCIS with B cells. Usually we just report classic LCIS. This is a very useful guideline for decision specimen. For example, if I have this near a margin, I'll uh, just uh, consider it as classic LCIS and, <coughs> excuse me, not report the margin. I don't know yet if this guideline can be, you know, consistently applied to core needle biopsy. There is limited data. We looked, we had, uh, you know, in one larger series, we had four cases of core needle biopsy with this morphology. Actually, this image comes from one of those cases and none of them at excision was upgraded. So, but that's not enough to say that it shouldn't be excised. Now, in contrast uh, to uh, classic LCIS, pleomorphic and florid LCIS are clinically and manifest, manifest clinically and by imaging. The most common manifestation is mammographic uh, calcification in about 80% of cases. Sometimes there can be an associated mass lesion. And oftentimes, in about 40 to 70% of the cases, they are associated with invasive carcinoma. All this suggesting that, uh, you know, the clinical presentation is different, but also the association with invasion is much higher than for classic LCIS. So, so this suggests a more aggressive clinical behavior. And in particular, I, um, you know, I recommend uh, in, uh, I, I become very, cautious of this and I, every time I have one of these florid or more pleomorphic cases, LCIS cases, uh, we need to be very careful and look uh, around to rule out micro invasion or just the presence of invasive carcinoma, but many times the micro invasion is present and kind of hides in areas of inflammation or, you know, a, a more reactive looking stroma. But uh, so I, in my practice, I oftentimes uh, look for these areas, select the block and do immunostochemical stains. And uh, again, I emphasize uh, that it's good to use positive stains, 
because an Ica digging stain and a calponin or my epithelial stains will not highlight the single cells that are present in the stroma. And here I thought that there was invasion and uh, it's hard to you know, see in this image, but I'm sure you can appreciate the different quality of the stroma in this area. And when I did the CK7, there were many cells that actually emerged in the same, uh, in the same location. And I could see them then in, uh, and I was, they were uh, you know, definitively look, epithelial looking in uh, uh, the corresponding h &E slide, but I would have never detected them with Icadirin or Talponin. So again, do the right thing. And the right stain sometimes may include also P120, that is a positive cytoplasmic stain, lobular neoplasia, a triple stain, even ER can be helpful in these cases. <laughs> We talked about the whole spectrum of non-invasive lobular neoplasia, now ranges from ALH all the way to pleomorphic LCIS, and the molecular alterations have been found that support the lobular genotype in all these lesions with an increasing number of genomic alterations. Speaking about Icadirin, uh, I want to make a few points about this. Uh, um, you all know it's a transmembrane glycoprotein involved in cell-to-cell -cell adhesion encoded by CDH1. Uh, the ductal epithelial cells have this continuous linear membrane positivity along the, the cell membrane. The myoepithelial cells, as I pointed out before, are also positive. There is positivity more in a linear distribution, but it appears to be a little bit more granular, and uh, they are positive where they face the adjacent epithelium. So you don't find much positivity on the other end uh, towards the basement membrane. And the, gran the staining is more granular, dot-like. And we know now that uh, in lobular neoplasia, loss of Icadirin is uh, a diagnostic hallmark that we use uh, daily. Um, in, uh, and can be detected with uh, immunostochemical stains quite reliably. And of course, early in the progression of blood neoplasia, starting from ALH. So this is a great tool that we have at our disposal. The endothelium may also be weakly positive for Icadirin as a note. So we use uh, all the time uh, Icadirin to separate classic LCIS from low grade uh, DCIS. Uh, and this is important in evaluation of margins and all that. We uh, use it also to support uh, lobular differentiation in uh, um, a lobular phenotype in a case of florid and pleomorphic LCIS that is Icadirin negative, while solid DCIS will have a nice membranous positivity. Now, Icadirin can, uh, however, uh, never you know, all these markers never work perfectly because in some cases, Icadirin expression has been shown to be retained in some invasive lobular carcinoma. This is a picture from the original paper by Da Silva. And actually, more recently, one of my colleagues, Anne Gabenstetter, has looked at Icadirin expression in invasive lobular carcinoma and correlated with the CDH1 somatic alteration and found, uh, you know, different pattern of expression. But the real pitfall uh, is not so much with invasive lobular, but with in situ lesions. Because uh, if uh, Icadirin is as aberrant expression in a lesion, and we're debating whether it's lobular or ductal, then positivity due to aberrant expression of Icadirin will may push us towards uh, the diagnosis of DCIS. So um, that sometimes may happen. Do we have a way to sort it all out? Then uh, uh, I'll just want to first uh, show you some examples of Icadirin expression pattern that are a little bit unusual, not the typical uh, findings in florid and pleomorphic LCIS. Sometimes we find the granular cytoplasmic staining like seen here. This is not membrane staining, so this is not supportive of ductal differentiation. Many times that occurs so if the tumor has more apocrine morphology. This is, a this is a pleomorphic LCIS, I would say, with granular staining of uh, uh, Icadirin. <clears throat> 
Uh, sometimes there is a staining that is more discrete uh, with the punctate uh, distribution that uh, seems to correlate with the Golgi apparatus. Maybe the protein is, uh, you know, produced, but then does not get uh, transferred to the cell membrane, uh, stays uh, like in this, in the Golgi apparatus. And this also supports uh, a diagnosis of lobular neoplasia, of florid or pleomorphic LCIS. Sometimes there is uh, this more fragmented granular membrane stain. We still, you know, um, consider this as an aberrant staining and we interpret this as uh, a negative uh, case of Icadirian expression effectively with uh, just focal aberrant staining. And uh, this will still uh, be con regarded as consistent with the diagnosis of uh, L florid LCIS or pleomorphic LCIS in this case. And uh, sometimes this uh, granular linear staining uh, with continuous positivity tends to be more in the center of the lesion. I don't know why, but uh, it's not uncommon. And uh, it is uh, positive. Uh, maybe we should discuss whether it's a one plus or not, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but uh, it could be a one plus staining. The important thing is uh, always go back and look at the staining in the normal ductal structure. It's much stronger, much more intense, and uh, it doesn't have this feeble uh, staining pattern. So in this case, uh, I would interpret this as a supportive of, uh, you know, this staining does not dissuade me from the diagnosis of florid LCIS. So it's an aberrant staining, at least in these photos. Now, Icadirin uh, works uh, together with the WINT-related proteins in ensuring cell-to-cell -cell adhesion. The intracytoplasmic domain of Icadirin uh, binds uh, the complex formed by P120 and beta-catenin, and then uh, together, they bind the actin through alpha catenin, they bind the uh, actin cytoskeleton of the cells. And all these complexes involved in keeping the cell shape. If it works properly and icadirin is properly expressed and properly functional, the cell shape will be columnar and the cell will be polarized like in a ductal cell. But if it doesn't, then this anchorage point on the inner aspect of the cell membrane is missing and the cytoskeleton of the cell recoils. That's how I imagine things. And the cell acquires this perfect spherical shape that corresponds then to this round shape that, uh, you know, we find in lobular neoplasia. And uh, uh, other, the other stains, uh, though, can the other markers can also be used in addition to icadirin to support the diagnosis of lobular neoplasia. In the Netherlands, uh, they seem to be very uh, keen on the use of beta catenin that is also lost uh, in lobular neoplasia, just like uh, icadirin. I don't know the mechanism by which it's lost but uh, it gives exactly the same uh, staining pattern. I like it a little bit less because it stains a little bit more the endothelial cells, uh, even sometimes uh, some of the myofibroblasts, I don't know why, but uh, uh, it gives essentially the same staining pattern in uh, um, lobular neoplasia and in the ductal cells and also in the myoepithelial cells. I like P120 because uh, no matter whether it's a ductal lesion or a lobular lesion, it always stains something. If uh, in the ductal cells, uh, it gives uh, this uh, linear membrane staining uh, that is identical to that of icadirin. So if it is a ductal cells, it will stain just like uh, icadirin in ductal cells. But if uh, icadirin is absent or is not functioning properly, then uh, P120 is produced almost in excess and increases actually and accumulates throughout the cytoplasm of the cells, giving this diffuse kind of fuzzy positivity, but at least we can see that the cells are staining and there, you know, we can infer that icadirin is either absent or dysfunctional. And this uh, is very useful in uh, the diagnosis of lobular neoplasia. Again, a nice membrane staining uh, 
for ductal carcinoma in situ, loss uh, of distribution, sorry, positivity uh, it throughout the cytoplasm in uh, this case that I would say is Florida LCIS. And it can be very useful in the cases where we have this aberrant uh, ecadigin staining pattern. This is a case that a low power, there is a mass forming lesion that uh, is very, um, you know, composed of very expanded ducts or asini with central necrosis. This looks like a typical case of Florida LCIS. The cytology is good for that. You see cell decision in between the cells, almost like the spidery cells I told you about before, but Icadigin is positive with a membrane stain. Notice that the membrane stain is weaker than that of the ductal cells that are present right next to this focus. PIC120 shows a diffuse staining, cytoplasmic staining. This is a lobular case. It actually had been also called DCIS based on this ecadigin stain. So P120 can be useful in these cases. Always be aware that if there is no gland formation in a solid intraductal carcinoma, you should always think about these special variants of um, lobular neoplasia. And here is a table where I summarize all these findings. Again, for me, P120 is the most const, you know, useful um, marker because uh, it uh, stains uh, either the membrane or the cytoplasm. And it can be useful also for the detection of microinvasive lobular carcinoma. In terms of core needle biopsy, um, they are, uh, I'll, uh, you know, give you some information about uh, the uh, upgrade rates and management. This is an old slide, but essentially has not changed very much. Uh, the cases here show the upgrade rate uh, in uh, cases of classic lobular neoplasia that was uh, deemed to be RAF path concordant. And these upgrades uh, range from uh, zero to 11% in some cases, but very, you know, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, there may be, have been some of uh, not so classic LCIS in these uh, particular cases, but overall the upgrade rate is 3.7%. And uh, this is a study we did uh, at our institution. Uh, we looked at 72 cases uh, of uh, uh, classic lobular neoplasia with very thorough correlation and, uh, you know, evaluation of rat path concordance. At excision, uh, we had one uh, tiny focus of DCIS and one tiny focus of well-differentiated invasive carcinoma. I think both were under three millimeters. The upgrade rate was only 3%. Since we published this paper, we stopped excising classic lobular neoplasia with um, rad path concordant findings diagnosed on core needle biopsy. And, uh, you know, our mantra is that if surgical excision can be safely spared, and the patient can be followed with imaging study, but excision is warranted if the radiologic pathologic findings are discordant and uh, or there is another lesion that by itself would mandate excision. This is generally the guideline that is used in the US, uh, in Northern, United, in Northern uh, America. I think also, uh, I believe uh, in Asia, they use the same guidelines. Um, but, uh, you know, we continue to excise pleomorphic and florid LCIS because the upgrade rate in all series that are compiled here together is very high, uh, greater than 70% in uh, all cases. Here is a series we just published, uh, I think last year, where, you know, the upgrade rate was 17% for florid LCIS, 25% for pleomorphic LCIS, most of the cases were invasive lobular carcinoma, many times uh, with uh, microinvasion. Um, so there is uh, almost a general agreement that this type of lesion, these special variants uh, of pleomorphic and florid LCIS always mandate surgical excision. This is now we switch to the European perspective and uh, this is a table that I found in a publication uh, 
uh, that report the statements by the agreements, by uh, the consensus guidelines, by a group of uh, uh, multidisciplinary expert uh, that met uh, a few years ago, I think in Switzerland. And their uh, uh, statement is that uh, there is a broad range of upgrade rates at excision, although they didn't really differentiate between classic and florid or pleomorphic LCIS. The upgrade rates for classic lobular neoplasia range between 2.4 and 10% for non-classic greater than 20%. And their final statement was that a lesion that contains classical lobular neoplasia and is visible on imaging should undergo excision with a vacuum assisted biopsy. Thereafter, surveillance is justified if there is no pathological radiologic discordance and no residual lesion, while all the morphologic variants of lobular neoplasia uh, should undergo open excision. So we are in perfect agreement regarding uh, the management of florid and pleomorphic LCIS, the management of classic lobular neoplasia differs a little bit. We no longer excise these lesions. And here is a table where there is more detailed information of the management of uh, uh, classic lobular neoplasia by different uh, societies uh, or that provide guidelines, again, in um, Northern America, Surgical excision is not required if a radiologic pathologic concordance is established. The same also according to ESMO and according to the Australian Cancer Association. In the UK, surgical excision is not required if the diagnosis was rendered with on a core biopsy obtained with a 14 gauge needle or vacuum, on a vacuum biopsy, and if there was a radiologic pathologic concordance. In Germany, they excise only a classic lobular neoplasia if it involves less, uh, more than three PDLUs in a vacuum assisted biopsy. So, you know, the, the management, I was actually amazed by the variety of management for classic lobular neoplasia. Again, we fall in this group, and again, we stopped many years ago, and I haven't seen any case with major recurrence of, uh, you know, a big invasive lobular carcinoma. Radiologic pathologic concordance is essential. In terms of the management of pleomorphic and florid LCIS, pretty much consistent throughout. Surgical excision is required, and it's classified either as a B5A or a B4 lesion in the UK for what pertains to florid LCIS. What do we do if we find this lesion near a margin? Here is an example. In general, we recommend the re-excision to clear the margin, and the optimal margin clearance is unknown. Usually, the same clearance as for DCIS is suggested, but it's really uh, not uh, data-driven. Many times at the periphery, we find classic lobular neoplasia, and then uh, we don't report classic LCIS, even though it's no, there is no question that these two lesions are related, and why should we excise this one and not this one remains a mystery. Here is, uh, there are the same uh, regional guidelines on the management of non-invasive lobular neoplasia in surgical excision classic lobular neoplasia, nobody reports uh, the size or stat margin status throughout the world, uh, thankfully. For pleomorphic LCIS, uh, negative margins and florid uh, negative margins should be considered. In uh, but ESMO recommends radiation therapy for cases of uh, pleomorphic LCIS, so they say they should be considered. The uh, National Health System Royal College of Pathologists uh, says that if you have pleomorphic LCIS, uh, you should record the extent of disease. There is no information on whether the extent of disease correlates with invasion or higher propensity to recurrence. Now, in terms of uh, clinical uh, you know, information, uh, what's the story of classic LCIS? I come from Memorial, so it's part of my contract, as I always say, that when I speak about LCIS, I mentioned Dr. Stewart, uh, and Dr. Foote, who first described LCIS in 1941 as being morphologically a precursor lesion of invasive lobular carcinoma because of its morphologic similarity and proximity 
Then uh, in the 80s and 90s, uh, it became more uh, regarded as a high risk lesion associated with an increased risk of bilateral breast carcinoma, um, of bilaterally, of breast carcinoma bilaterally, that was uh, higher for LCIS, eight to 10 times fold, fold that of the general population, or only four to four, uh, five times higher for ALH. And that follow up, uh, there was the credence that uh, invasive ductal and invasive lobular would develop uh, with the same uh, frequency. Here are two, uh, some studies from good old days and more recent data that have looked at the follow up of classic LCIS. They, all the studies have a long follow up, 19, 24 years. So the more recent series have a shorter follow up, uh, nearly seven, eight years. But carcinomas developed um, in both, uh, um, you know, in all these studies, the rate was higher in uh, the older series, probably because the follow-up was also longer. In more recent series, uh, the follow-up, uh, uh, there were patients that developed carcinoma in 15, nine to 10, per in 10 to 15% of the cases. Most of the carcinomas were invasive lobular back then and actually also in current uh, data there is either an equal frequency of invasive ductal and invasive lobular or uh, you know a definitely a higher incidence of invasive lobular carcinoma on the ipsilateral side you know supporting the notion that these are uh, um, cases that lobular neoplasia is a precursor lesion classic lobular neoplasia I want to mention also the information from this study from uh, Tari King from our institution. They evaluated a thousand women diagnosed at our center and uh, at follow up, uh, two per, they demonstrated that there was a 2% annual incidence of breast carcinoma, but hormone uh, chemo prevention was significant in reducing the rate of uh, breast carcinoma. And uh, in particular, women who took hormonal chemo prevention had only a 7% rate of carcinoma compared to 21% for women who didn't take it. So in uh, this group of women with classic lobular neoplasia is useful to give uh, the patient uh, hormonal therapy if they take it. And uh, this, uh, so today we regard uh, classic lobular neoplasia both as a risk indicator and non-obligate precursor the risk is greater for ipsilateral than contralateral carcinoma. Most uh, ipsilateral carcinoma are invasive lobular, and uh, there is uh, evidence that uh, demonstrates clonality between uh, invasive lobular and adjacent LCIS. In terms of staging, according to ESMO, LCIS is still regarded as an in situ lesion and classified as a PTIS. There is a statement that pleomorphic LCIS may behave like DCIS. Florid LCIS is not mentioned uh, in the ESMO guidelines from published in 2019 because uh, it was actually standardized at the same time by the WHO. So uh, ESMO released these guidelines before the WHO classification. In the, the American uh, um, the American Joint Commission for Cancer, eighth edition, uh, the staging actually mentions LCIS as a benign lesion. And <laughs> there is uh, no longer a classification of it as an in situ lesion and pleomorphic and florid LCIS are not even mentioned. And there is no mention of any LCIS with a more aggressive behavior. So we pathologists are not happy about that. Hopefully it will change in the future. What happens if a patient has pleomorphic or florid LCIS without invasion, what happens to this patient if we follow them? Well, there is very limited follow-up data. Here, there is a total, you know, in these different series, a total of nearly 150 cases followed for variable length of time. Many, uh, there were a few recurrences, 17 cases. So it's about 9% of the cases recurred. The majority of the recurrences consisted of invasive lobular carcinoma, either clear-cut invasive or microinvasive. Some cases uh, 
of invasive ductal, some uh, recurrences as pleomorphic or even DCIS. And if we look at whether, you know, the patients that recurred had received radiotherapy or hormone therapy, well, it's really unclear because, you know, not everywhere it's easy to sort out if the patient received radiation or not. They say, though, specifically that uh, the two patients in this, uh, that recurred uh, in these two series uh, had received radiotherapy. On the other side, uh, patients who receive hormone therapy seem to have had uh, uh, a little bit more recurrences uh, altogether than the patient uh, who received radiotherapy, I would think. But again, the data is very limited uh, and there is no way to make it any definitive conclusion about this. But, uh, you know, overall, it seems that hormone therapy is not uh, too effective in blocking uh, the recurrences, in preventing recurrences in, if you have a pleomorphic and florid LCIS. And that is because probably not uh, positivity for ER and PR in these variants may be very reduced or even absent. So in terms of take home messages, uh, we discussed the many morphologic variants and pitfalls, uh, or morphologic mimics and pitfalls of classic lobular neoplasia. It's a high risk lesion and uh, also a non obligate morphologic precursor. There is an increased relative risk of carcinoma at follow up. In terms of management, if you have only classic and ALH, LCIS and ALH, no margin status is reported. In the US, uh, in Northern America in general, we don't excise rat path concordant for needle biopsy with classic lobular neoplasia, but elsewhere follow the local management guidelines. In terms of pleomorphic and florid LCIS, uh, the, we have now definite, you know, good criteria, morphologic diagnostic criteria, so we should apply them uh, correctly. In terms of these are lesions that present clinically with pleomorphic or indeterminate calcification or as a mass. So they, that is a very different uh, from the incidental finding of classic lobular neoplasia. In terms of immunohistochemistry, they stain the same, uh, um, but use cytoplasmic, uh, the same uh, for Icadirin uh, um, for as classic LCIS, but cytoplasmic P120 can be useful if you detect aberrant Icadirin stain. I didn't discuss at length, but the molecular alteration supports lobular phenotype. Look for microinvasion. That is very common in these cases. As I always say, I spend the time and the money in doing immunohistochemical stains if I see an area of inflammation or reactive stroma around these tumors and include the positive markers. If you find them in an excision, there is no, in a core biopsy and there is no microinvasion or invasion, they need to be excised regardless of rad path concordance. The follow-up data is limited. If you have these two lesions, I think re-excision should be done if it is feasible. And there are very limited data on the benefits of hormone therapy and radiotherapy in these patients. So I, I don't have a definitive information. And again, I thank you very much for your attention. This is the very last lecture. So thank you all.